Well, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, this is the Prevention Collaborative webinar, and we're going to be talking today about the Unite for a Better Life program. So we're really fortunate to have two people who are involved in both the evaluation and research on that program, as well as the implementation. Uh, so looks like it's going to be a really great next 90 minutes. Um, I just want to note that this is, um, because there is so much rich experience in particular from this program and adaptation to different contexts, we've actually decided to do a series of three webinars on this uh, subject matter. So this is the first and we look forward to welcoming uh, Vandana and Samuel again uh, in the future and all of you hopefully to join us. Uh, so, Unite for a Better Life is a gender transformative program that aims to prevent intimate partner violence and HIV. It's delivered by trained facilitators to groups of women, men, or couples within the context of the traditional coffee ceremony in rural Ethiopia or tea talks in the Somali refugee context. Through either 14 in rural Ethiopia or 16 humanitarian context participatory skills building sessions, the program targets the underlying social, cultural, and behavioral determinants of IPV in these contexts. Uh, so during this webinar, Dr. Vandana Sharma and Samuel Tawolde will highlight lessons and challenges of addressing social norms related to IPV through programming and research together with preliminary evaluation findings. And as I mentioned in the second webinar in this series, they will present the process of adapting the program to a humanitarian context, including displacement related changes and norms. And a third webinar will focus on an innovative podcast based version of the program, which was co-created by Somali refugees and delivered in a humanitarian context. Uh, I'm Kathy Durand. I'm the Director of Strategy and Operations at the Collaborative, and I will be the moderator for today. Uh, um, again, this, is, um, this webinar is organized by the Prevention Collaborative. Uh, we are a global networked organization that aims to strengthen programming in the area of um, prevention of violence against women, uh, particularly focusing on IPV and violence within the family. So we do also look at prevention programming around the intersections between violence against women and violence against children. Um, we have two wonderful speakers with us today. We're so happy to, to have them join us and to, to give their time. We have Dr. Vandana Sharma, who is a global health researcher at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative with expertise in impact evaluations, randomized control trials, and programming in development and humanitarian contexts. Dr. Sharma's research includes randomized control trials of interventions to reduce maternal mortality in northern Nigeria and to reduce IPV and HIV transmission in Ethiopia, as well as mixed methods IPV research among Somali refugees. Other current research interests of Dr. Sharma include assessing gender biases within humanitarian organizations and measuring gender-based violence risk mitigation in humanitarian emergencies. In 2018, she was named on the Canadian Women in Global Health list, which highlights the contributions of leaders working across the spectrum of global health. And in 2019, Dr. Sharma was awarded the Canadian Excellence in Global Women and Children's Health Award for her contributions nationally and globally to improve women's and children's health. We also have Samuel Tewolde, who has over 12 years of experience in public health responses to sexual violence and GBV including implementing the Unite for a Better Life Gender Transformative IPV and HIV Prevention Project among Somali refugees in Ethiopia, the IPV and HIV Prevention Project in Butajira, Ethiopia, the Male Norms Initiative HIV and GBV Prevention Randomized Control Trial Project in Ethiopia, uh, and a number of child development projects. In his current role, he supports programmatic and capacity development in the Healthy Relationship and Family Wellbeing Project, which aims to improve communication and relationships and promote the well being and rights of women and children within African communities in the United Kingdom. So, welcome, Sand welcome Samuel and Vandana. Uh, I'm going to turn things over to them. They're going to uh, do a presentation and, and share their experience with us uh, for the next um, 
30 to 35 minutes, and then we'll open it up for a Q&A period. Um, so again, if you have questions during the presentation and you don't want to forget them, please do um, please do uh, write them in the chat box. We'll be the, the facilitation team will be capturing them and we'll come back to them as soon as we enter the Q&A period. Okay, Samuel Vandana, over to you. Great, thank you so much, Kathy. Um, I'm so delighted to um, be here and to have the opportunity together with my colleague Samuel to share lessons and findings from our work. Um, and I will uh, note, I think there are some other members of our team um, who are also um, present uh, in the webinar. So um, perhaps during the discussion, um, some of them may be able to as well contribute um, and share some uh, experiences. Great, so um, I'm going to be speaking to you about Unite for a Better Life, which um, as, as Kathy mentioned, is a program to prevent and reduce intimate partner violence and HIV transmission, which was first developed and tested in rural Ethiopian contexts. In particular, um, it was implemented in the Southern Nations, Nationalities and Peoples region in Ethiopia um, between 2012 and 2018 with a number of key partners. Um, this includes the Abdul Latif Jamil Poverty Action Lab, or JPAL, which is where I was based uh, prior to Harvard uh, when we did this work, um, as well as the Addis Ababa University in Gender Health and the Ethiopian Public Health Association. We also had support from numerous stakeholders, including the Ethiopian Ministry of Health and the Ethiopian National HIV AIDS Prevention and Control Office, or HABCO, and we received funding from an anonymous donor and uh, Le Fondation de France. Next slide, please. And so um, the agenda for today's um, presentation includes a brief introduction about uh, Unite for a Better Life and sort of the different program and research streams that we have under the program to give you a better sense um, of, of what we're doing. Um, and then we'll be uh, delving deeper into the uh, rural Ethiopian um, version of the program um, and focus on how it was developed and implemented. And then we'll um, touch on um, some of the preliminary uh, findings from the evaluation that we undertook in parallel to the implementation. Next slide, please. So let's get started with um, an overview of the Unite for a Better Life program. Next slide, please. So Unite for a Better Life began in 2012. Um, and as you can see from this slide, it encompasses several different research and program streams, which all aim to generate evidence about what works in different contexts. UBL was first developed for a rural Ethiopian context where each uh, participatory session is delivered by trained facilitators within the context of the traditional Ethiopian coffee ceremony to groups of men, women, and couples. And as you'll hear a little bit later in the presentation, um, our team conducted a large cluster randomized control trial across four districts uh, between 2014 and 2018 um, with uh, just under 7,000 households. Now, uh, we also received funding from ELRA's Humanitarian Innovation Fund to adapt the program for a humanitarian context. Um, and these are Somali refugee camps in Dolo Auto, Ethiopia, where we conducted formative research to first understand the drivers of IPV and HIV risk in this context, including how displacement has changed those risks, and then adapted the program for that particular setting. Um, new sessions were added and uh, the sessions were delivered in the context of Somali tea talks. In addition, um, in order to serve harder to reach populations, including displaced populations in emergencies, um, with funding from the World Bank and the Sexual Violence Research Initiative, the UBL program expanded to include um, a series of podcast episodes that correspond to the UBL in-person sessions. Um, and I'll be, our team will be able to share more information about some of the, um, the other versions of the program, the humanitarian version and the podcast version in future webinars as part of this series. But today we will focus on the original UBL program um, and have a chance to um, examine that in more detail. So next slide, please. 
Um, so the areas where um, Unite for a Better Life uh, was implemented um, is in our region um, that's highlighted in this map with a kind of red dot to the south of Addis Ababa called, uh, uh, you can see the, the major city in that area is called Butajira. There were four districts, Mescan, Marco, Sordo, and Silte, um, where the program was implemented. Now, this particular area um, was uh, part of the WHO multi-country study um, that many of you are familiar with um, that found a very high prevalence of IPV in this area. Around 71% of women um, at that time reported ever experiencing physical and or sexual IPV. And when we started this work um, eight years ago, um, you know, there was limited evidence on effective IPV prevention interventions, um, especially for this context, and as well on the relative effectiveness of interventions uh, around IPV that target women versus men versus couples. Next slide, please. Now, I'm going to hand over now to Samuel Tulde, who um, played a key role in the development and implementation of the program. And he's going to provide more insights into that process. And then I'll come in, uh, come back in a little bit later uh, to speak a bit more about the evaluation and research. So over to you, Samuel. Thank you so much, Bandana. Um, hi, everyone. And I'm also very uh, happy to be here and share with you uh, lessons and experience uh, we have had from our iconic uh, brand we call Unite for a Better Life, abbreviated as uh, UBL. Uh, so uh, the next slide, please. Uh, as you can see, UBL is um, an in-person gender transformative curricula-based uh, intervention. Uh, designed for groups of men, women, and couples in rural Ethiopia uh, with the aim of uh, reducing and preventing uh, IPV and HIV. And it um, employs adult learning principle and it's participatory tailored for people in, uh, uh, how we call it, non-humanitarian context and sensitive to Ethiopian uh, religious and uh, cultural values. And it includes facilitated uh, uh, interactive group uh, discussions, different activities and exercises, all uh, targeting the underlying social, cultural, and uh, behavioral um, determinants of IPV. And uh, in each of the program, there, were, uh, there are 14 sessions per curricula, and topics include gender roles, sexuality. Uh, communication, uh, emotional regulations and conflict resolution, uh, power control relationship, uh, sexual uh, boundaries and sexual consent, etc. So there were around 14 distinct uh, sessions covered by the program. And in each uh, group of men, women, couple, we have around 20 participants and delivered on uh, twice weekly the highly respected uh, Ethiopian cultural community or practice that we call the Ethiopian coffee ceremony. Uh, and I'm sure um, many of you are familiar about my country, Ethiopia, who gave uh, coffee to the world. So not only the flavor of the coffee or the liquid matters for us, for Ethiopians, but the entire ceremony has a significant uh, uh, socio-cultural values. So people sit uh, for coffee for hours to drink and discuss various issues ranging from personal, family, uh, country-wise, uh, as, as well as global matters. So UBL uses this practice uh, to serve uh, as a platform for uh, intervention delivery and uh, initiate natural discussion, a discussion people are familiarized with and with, you know, while having their coffees. So our assumption here was uh, using the Ethiopian coffee as a platform to initiate dialogue. It may increase uh, you know, the cultural relevance and uh, our program could become uh, more effective. And the second component, which I would discuss later on, would be to serve as an opportunity to model and practice gender equitable behavior among our uh, male participants. Next slide, please. Uh, so, you know, when, when uh, um, 
designing uh, um, this project, uh, uh, we also have you know an idea of having a high quality education or facilitation. Uh, and uh, our facilitators, as you can see in the model, we are going to deliver a program that uh, may have uh, an impact. So our facilitators must display some equitable behaviors before going to the public, before you know, uh, uh, you know, delivering sessions. So we have also one program component having high quality um, facilitators in our uh, program who would be first participating as a discussion participants first, you know, to display their non equitable behaviors that they may keep before into more, you know, fair ones, and then as well as provide the various uh, um, facilitation skill trainings. And then, of course, when crafting the UBL program, we considered or followed the logical. Uh, and a proven way of doing similar IPV and HIV prevention programs known as the ecological framework, which uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And the model provides like a uh, you know, sort of conceptual fr framework for a broader uh, approach to addressing IPV and HIV. And it also uh, emphasizes that to change an individual's behavior, uh, programs of this mag magnitude need to work with individuals as well as you know the various uh, influential factors, including family, community, societal. So when designing the UBL IPV program, we consider these various factors that are included in the ecological framework. And for example, you know, if we are concerned, let's say yeah, about a behavior related to sexual abuse within a relationship, we ask different questions, uh, you know, to address uh, from individual until the societal level. Questions such as, you know, what do uh, women as well as men see this is it a problem? Do they know they consider it, and what do they think about it, and what do others uh, within their immediate relationship, uh, you know, think about this problem? And how do people within the community view? Uh, is it a problem, or is it something that they, you know, a private matter, for, exa for example? And what about the uh, other influential uh, community leaders, including religious as well as, you know? Uh, spiritual, I mean, um, influential figures within the community think about this. How does the legal system react to this kind of problem? So we exhaustively try to, uh, you know, uh, ask various questions that are included within the eco ecological model prior to developing the curriculum or adapting it. Next slide, please. Uh, so, uh, in terms of design, uh, uh, using its uh, theoretical, uh, you know, the theory of uh, change logic model, UBL uh, was designed to logically address the interaction of individual, relationship, community, and societal factors that are, you know, influencers uh, of, uh, you know, IPV as well as transmission of HIV. So uh, UBL focuses at individual level, but it consistently considers all levels when it comes to messaging. So it's not only an individual focused. Yes, we focus individually, but you know the entire component when it comes to messaging considers all levels. And then of course the sequence uh, where uh, we uh, employed when it comes to developing the logic model, we try to identify first the health goal, which is reducing uh, you know IPV and HIV uh, transmission. And the second component was the identification of important long as well as short term behavior uh, that we want to see from the individuals. Uh, this may include, for example, you know, increased knowledge and skills, improved communication, etc. And of course, the third component is identification and selection of uh, important risk and protective factors, uh, such as the absence of communication, it could be lack of skill, uh, uh, personal at attitudes, individual gender norms. And then of course, the last component was the identifying uh, and selecting various activities that would help us uh, reach to our, goal, to our goal. And as such, each of the 14 sessions for men, women, couple are designed um, to address various uh, intimate partner violence determinants, including knowledge, skills, beliefs, personal values, attitudes, etc. Next slide, please. Uh, so, uh, one of the you know the component of the program design is like a facilitation model that we uh, had at uh, UBL, and this was like you know. Right at the beginning uh, of uh, you know the program, try to uh, 
draw distinction between uh, a teacher and a you know, facilitator. This was very much for us, uh, especially, we all know that teacher is someone whom we consider as you know, a source of information for knowledge uh, into the student's mind, whereas the facilitator is someone who draw knowledge out of the and uh, you know out of the participants or uh, draws uh, experiences from the participants and then of course promotes discussion to shape various attitudes and uh, build the skills so as to change certain behaviors that we consider would be important so drawn this uh, sort of distinction at the very uh, beginning uh, either was a you know with participants i mean facilitators or with participants was very much important because it creates some sort of you know an interactive uh, discussion that would help us build you know bondage with with the participants they would believe us would be obtaining different opinions but if we don't put that tone at the very beginning they may consider participants like teacher student uh, experience and then we might not uh, get various differing opinions from from which we can you know try to challenge these norms and uh, like I said, the distinction uh, was communicated at all levels. First with the participants, I mean facilitators, followed by two, the participants. And then of course the second component is the curriculum version. We have had like three curriculum for men, women and couple only. And each of the men uh, uh, group would be uh, facilitated by a male facilitator. A woman group uh, participants would be uh, you know, I would, would be having a female uh, facilitator and couples we paired male and female uh, facilitators for that group because uh, there are, you know, uh, issues that are very much sensitive with whom a participant may not discuss with uh, the opposite sex, such as, for example, you know, condom practices that we have had in our uh, program, uh, um, you know, as an HIV prevention method and sexuality issues violence is something that is very much sensitive so in the couple we have like the paired uh, facilitators next slide please uh, and then of course uh, facilitation during the coffee ceremony which i promised earlier to come back <coughs> sorry so right at the beginning um, um, this considering coffee uh, as an um, uh, opportunity to model and practice gender equi equitable uh, behavior was very much, you know, uh, in our mindset, uh, uh, similar to many areas, I'm sure you, you all agree. The norm is, uh, the, especially in Ethiopia, is that women does, you know, most of the domestic tasks and men, basically the majority of men consume. And same thing as with the traditional coffee. Um, you know, if you have like a cup of, I mean, uh, materials for a coffee somewhere in the corner, woman simply grabs it and know what to do. But we would be dying of thirst uh, and nobody is going to touch, no men would, would touch that. So we want to challenge this. And for us, uh, implementing the curriculum within the Ethiopian coffee uh, ceremony would pro provide like, you know, an opportunity to break this cycle and promote more equitable uh, uh, gender roles within uh, the relationship and um, making men do, doing coffee was uh, a true test of the program I could say. Uh, what I mean by this is uh, you know the simple task of coffee preparation uh, uh, doesn't mean anything but the, the significant contribution you know when a man does that is something very much you know important because they have never done that in uh, either their private life or in public life. So asking men or systematically trying to convince them to do by becoming first a model means uh, a big deal because if I uh, assume we have like in a group of, for example, male group 20 males whom, uh, uh, with whom they share uh, various norms, with whom they socialize. So if we have one courage man, uh, the facilitator who would be modeling this activity for those couple, you know, first two sessions, and then systematically roll the ball back to the participants, that's a big deal. They are practicing something that is culturally taboo among those, uh, you know, closer uh, friends and relatives or, you know, individuals with whom they socialize. And then, of course, it would be opening more room for more uh, tax, I mean, task sharing within the relationship. And that has a significant contribution in terms of 
uh, having less burden on women, uh, improving communication, and becoming exemplary to children, and then of course breaking the taboo that this is men's role and women's role, etc. So uh, we have tested this uh, at the very beginning at the pretest. I was the one who was tested first. I have to prove that you know this thing I can do it, and then of course I was challenged by. Uh, the master uh, trainers whom I, I was training, uh, you know, nobody's going to do that. But of course, after the second and third uh, sessions, systematically, if I can do it, hey, I need some brave men who would be taking over. And then we brought, I roll back the, you know, the ball to them. And then of course, they take it over. Same approach we used with, with the participants. Next slide, please. So here uh, you, you can see one of uh, the male uh, UBL participants uh, in rural Ethiopia, uh, you know, roasting coffee, which uh, normally this would be uh, an unusual sight to see either in rural or in many parts of uh, you know, uh, my country. And at the very beginning, this was like a controversial idea. Uh, but through experiments, through the various, you know, like in the piloting and the pre-testing and piloting, and then we integrated it in such a thoughtful way that it was uh, very effective and men, uh, as a result, did not drop out of the discussion, which was, which was you know, a success. At the very beginning, we were fearing that what if they say that, you know, the, the program is, you know, here to make us like, you know, a woman task. And, but we didn't experience this because we learn, you know, lessons from one uh, episode to the other, pretest. First, first pilot, second pilot, we integrated it in a, in a way that is uh, transferred more smoothly. Next slide, please. And here also you would see a photo of couples participating in one of our couple session in uh, Putajra area also. And of course, following this presentation would be displaying a very short video that's available on YouTube that would highlight some of the programs. Next slide, please. Uh, so the program lessons, um, uh, so number one, you know, uh, community engagement was very much important for us, engaging community at all levels. We have had various consultations, various advisory, uh, you know, boards that we established, very, various briefings and communication in terms of, you know, participation right from the development, adaptation and implementation process. And this is something that we have learned, engage the community in every single uh, and then, of course, you know, process and then the entire process will become more effective. And second, in terms of research and piloting and uh, doing formative research was uh, another very uh, important les lesson for us that uh, in a way that uh, enabled us to critically think about the problem on hand, develop, you know, the logic model, uh, considering all uh, uh, factors that are responsible for IPV and HIV in our community. And then, of course, uh, proper research and piloting also has uh, helped us uh, define community interest, you know, how to access them, uh, what are the various, you know, nitty gritty things we need to uh, implement and, you know, uh, a project of this magnitude. And then, of course, the other component was uh, transformative and experience based training for facilitators. This was very critical because we have developed a multi, you know, a model that has a multi stage facilitator training process. Uh, which was critical for the success of the program because uh, you know uh, you know these are the backbone of the project and they must be you know benefiting from this project first we have to see that because tomorrow they will be going out there to the public and sell an idea and when we want that transaction to be profitable and then of course having the program positively uh, impact uh, uh, our facilitators was critical like i said to sell the idea at a greater profit. And then in terms of uh, program delivery, uh, connecting the intervention uh, to participants' daily lives was very much important. Uh, and then of course, piloting and the pretest and the various consultations were also another important lesson. Uh, you know, um, in terms of, for example, very minor things that you might consider, but would have a potential impact on the on the project, such as determining the sessions, the you know the delivery modalities, the timing, the frequency. These were very much important things that we have in our delivery, and of course, risk mitigation and ethical considerations 
were also put uh, uh, in, in this program. And the last point that I have in terms of this area is that, you know, having a very strong teamwork and bondage one another among all the, the you know, either the program manager top level or, you know, the, you know, the security guard at the lower level, we have had a very strong uh, you know, bondage, and of course, our aim was to make this project ses successful. And then, of course, by having a very uh, good teamwork at all levels, this was very much key. And we have witnessed that this bondage to be uh, created also not only at the organizational level, but going uh, down in the field between the facilitator and the participants. At the time of you know the goodbye session, fourteen time, uh, there was a lot, lot of you know uh, emotional. Um, feelings and that was uh, quite a very good experience next slide please so um the last point i was to because i'm running out of time and so these are the good practices and the challenge that we have as you can see the good practice uh, ensuring safety everyone's safety was at the core of the program for example we have had uh, psychiatrists available either to, for the program staff uh, as well as for the participants throughout the project period and measuring unintended consequence. I'm sure Vandana would, would tell us more later on this one. And of course, using participatory um, approach in everything we do, uh, you know, either from choosing a venue of discussion, we have had around more than 230, 40 discussion sites or trying to, to, to find appropriate locations or timing. We participate or engage our community members and of course building and generating evidence was something that uh, this project has registered as a good practice in terms of challenge sensitive uh, the topic sensitivity especially sexual relationships and then of course religi religious uh, consideration either within the muslim community or the christian community associated with you know shyness for example among you know some of our couple participants uh, talking about sensitive issues was something that we uh, experienced. And then there was a fluctuation of attendance daily, I mean, uh, mainly among uh, participants, especially in this area. Uh, and in general in Ethiopia, we are connected one another. So for example, if someone dies in a certain area, the entire village would be going to the funeral and mourning this might have, you know, have a certain impact on the project. And then, of course, we have had also some seasonal challenge in terms of uh, rain, harvest, people work together hand with hand by hand. And then, of course, this has an impact But we creatively try to accommodate needs also based on, I mean, considering the challenge. And then in terms of incentives, we provided not cash, but in-kind incentive as a way of saying thank you for their, you know, uh, participation in the program and then of course the incentive range from either from soap to you know edible oil or flour or pasta and then of course this would help us also increase attendance and of course um, safety and minimizing uh, potential harms was uh, another uh, challenge we have had especially when people are very eager you know when learning a new new skill they may go home and apply and of course we don't have any jurisdiction to, to protect them and that has some some uh, you know impact and of course although we told them change takes time try to apply it slowly find you know an appropriate you know time etc this has some uh, impact and when it comes to couples uh, uh, programming uh, they usually come abandoning their entire life including kids kids harv you know the harvest or livestock etc uh, this was quite uh, challenging. Then there were uh, also considerations about how to structure sensitive discussions within session. Uh, for example, uh, in the couples group, like I said, male-female facilitators will be present. So we try to organize same-sex activities when it comes to sensitive issues so that they can feel very much comfortable. And then, of course, organizational bureaucracy was another uh, and last cha uh, you know, challenge, especially when you have uh, the field office here and the local implementing partner uh, mandated to manage resources uh, out there in the capital. And then of course this has uh, had some significant uh, challenge in terms of you know, availing funders or trying to ensure uh, project inputs are you know, available. And with that, I end my uh, presentation and thank you so much for your patience listening to me. And I'll be back uh, later on with Q&A, back to Vandana who will tell us more from the results than I did with you know, uh, 
the processes. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Samuel. Um, great, so let's uh, move in to speak a bit more about the evaluation. Um, and I'll just sort of give you a kind of high level look at what we've done in terms of um, the evaluation. So next slide, please. Um, so in terms of monitoring during the implementation, um, we recorded um, participants' attendance within, within each session to be able to kind of track attendance and um, exposure to the intervention. We also, in each group, um, so as, as Samuel mentioned, there's about 20 individuals who participate in each group and then kind of meet twice a week for seven weeks to undergo the full program. And so in each of those groups, uh, we would randomly select two participants um, after or during each session to um, collect some, just a, a brief post-session questionnaire uh, to collect some information on kind of comprehension of information after the session and um, some attitudinal um, information and intentions to change behavior. And then um, the program's intervention coordinator, um, Samuel, also um, closely sort of monitored uh, the implementation and he would observe uh, group sessions um, to assess, you know, fidelity to the intervention. He would provide ongoing feedback and support to the facilitators. Now, in addition to the monitoring, um, as I've mentioned earlier, we did conduct a cluster randomized control trial to evaluate the um, impact and the relative effectiveness of the different versions of UBL. So the women's UBL, men's UBL, and couples UBL compared to a control group. Next slide, please. So here you see the, um, the trial designs. So it was a four-arm trial. Um, participants in the control arm received a brief informational session on violence reduction, but did not engage in any Unite for a Better Life groups. Um, each uh, of the uh, each UBL intervention, so the women's intervention, the men's intervention, and the couple's intervention, each one was implemented in uh, 16 villages, which had been randomly assigned. And um, the control arm as well had 16 villages. Um, within each of the villages, around 106 individuals were randomly selected for participation in the trial. And then in the intervention villages, there was a further randomization done um, where 80% of those individuals were selected for um, to be invited to participate and the other 20% were only followed um, at baseline and endline to assess spillover effects within the communities. The endline data were collected at two years post-intervention and we had an overall follow-up rate at endline of about 88%. Next slide, please. And then just really quickly, some high level findings. Um, the publication is forthcoming. It will be out in August, so stay tuned for that. Um, but the sort of main uh, findings are that the uh, reductions in IPV were uh, in the men's UBL arm. Uh, so we saw reductions in male perpetration of past year sexual IPV and uh, past year physical and or sexual IPV, as well reductions in women's experience of past uh, year physical and or sexual IPV. Um, and then in the highly adherent sample, um, of uh, participants who completed um, 12 out of the 14 or more sessions. Uh, we also saw reductions in male per perpetration of physical IPD in that men's arm. Um, neither the uh, women's arm or the couple's uh, version of the program had effects on IPV. However, all three arms um, demonstrated um, positive and significant impacts on a range of other outcomes. Um, some of our secondary outcomes related to HIV, um, which were condom use at last intercourse and discussing sex and HIV risk with their partner. And then there was also evidence of um, increased male involvement in child care and household chores and joint decision making. Next slide, please. And so just a couple of quotes here. Um, 
from one from a, a female participant of the program and another from one of the facilitators. So um, the, the woman who participated um, said, thanks to the discussions, our husbands are respecting us more than ever. We the ladies talk about this over coffee and we think that our partners who participated in the program are on the same track. And one of the facilitators shared how the program transformed his own life. He, he indicated that, you know, the program has made significant changes in my personal life. There were many traditional gender norms that I considered impossible to change. The program has enabled me to change this thinking. And so I think this touches a little bit on this two-stage model of facilitation that Samuel mentioned earlier, whereby the the individuals recruited to be facilitators actually underwent the program themselves first as participants so that they had the opportunity to kind of reflect on and challenge any um, inequitable norms and behaviors that they themselves might hold before undergoing training specifically on facilitation. Next slide, please. And then looking to the future, um, some of the things that we're hoping to do with the program um, for rural Ethiopia is to look at um, uh, long-term follow-ups to assess the sustainability of the intervention effects. We also are interested to compare um, the in-person program with some of the other modalities of program delivery, such as the podcast project. And I haven't discussed that today, but um, it will be a focus of one of the future uh, webinar episodes, uh, but just to kind of give you a quick um, summary of what that is, um, what we ended up doing was converting uh, the sessions, uh, the in-person sessions into 20 to 30 minute audio podcasts, which comprise dramas, expert interviews, and a range of other content. And that was co-created with um, the, the beneficiary population together. And that approach can help reach harder to reach populations. And especially in you know, situations like the current um, restrictions that we have with COVID, an approach such as the podcast um, intervention could be a feasible way to um, continue to engage with um, affected populations. And then finally, we are also exploring options to um, scale up the program um, in this region and potentially in other sites. Next slide, please. And then in terms of resources available, I just wanted to touch on this really quickly. So as, as you've heard, there are three curricula um, available, one for women's groups, one for couples groups, and one for men's groups. And we have those available in um, English, Amharic, and in Somali language. There's also a Unite for a Better Life program implementation and facilitator training toolkit that we developed um, with funding from ELRA. And finally, a visual media toolkit, which was designed to build empathy and challenge gender norms through visual media approaches and is um, developed for program implementers and master trainers working on um, IPV prevention. And so, you know, feel free to reach out if you are interested in more information about those resources. Next slide, please. And um, I'm going to end there. We've got um, both of our email addresses on this slide. So, you know, feel free as well to reach out in the future. Um, and uh, I look very much forward to our uh, question and answer session that we're going to um, embark on now. So thank you. Great. Uh, thank you very much, both uh, Vandana and Samuel for sharing your experience. Um, we already have a number of questions in the chat box. People are um, clearly very interested in, in the program and it's really great to hear about in depth about the model that you used as well as the evaluation results and we'll certainly look forward to seeing that study. I think you said it was coming out in August. Um, and just quickly to confirm, are the all the UBL resources that you um, uh, that you put these are publicly available, and, and maybe you could put your website um, down where they can get them. Is are they available on a website, or would people contact you for them? Okay, great. Right, I just um, uh, pasted in the website in the link. Now we just launched the website recently, so we'll be continuing to add. Uh, content and materials um, in the coming months. Uh, for the moment, um, 
most of those resources are not yet publicly available. Um, so if people are interested, feel free to reach out directly and, and we can discuss. Okay, that's great. Uh, and just on that same vein, there was a question around whether any of the formative research that you did is publicly available. I guess they, people would contact you directly if they were interested in learning more about that as well. Absolutely. And, um, and then, as I mentioned, the results of the trial will be out um, in the coming weeks in August. Okay, great. Okay, well, we're going to jump into questions from the audience. I see lots coming through the chat box. So again, um, please use the chat box. And if you would like to, um, to speak, please uh, raise your hand or flag it for the facilitation team and we will, we will unmute you. Um, so I'm going to start with three questions related to the facilitation. Um, the first one from Lori Heisey, which I think has been partly answered, but um, the second part is, is good. Did you say all facilitators go through the program before they become facilitators? And how much additional training do they receive? So that, that part about the additional training, I think it was clear that they do go through the program by the end of your presentation. Um, the second question from Terza. Brown around facilitation. You mentioned that facilitators had to model gender equitable behavior. Do you do um, reflective practice as part of the training to, to you know, develop leadership in this or were they selected uh, for this? And then there is one other question here. Um, I'm wondering from Marissa uh, Sterniste, I'm wondering what the training for facilitators looks like. How are facilitators selected and how long is their training? So yeah, we, we know from the evidence that, that this facilitator uh, portion is so important and your model is very interesting. So lots of interest here. If you could speak to those three questions, that would be great. Okay. So Go ahead, Samuel. That's great. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So, um, in uh, you know, in in terms of um, yeah, I've unmuted myself. So, in terms of the facilitators, you know, first of all, uh, facilitators are selected from the local community because this is one lesson that we have learned from the process, either pretest, pilots, etc. Because being local would be easier to manage them addresses any sort of barriers that we may have in terms of language barriers or cultural barriers, etc. So we selected them from the local. And then the first thing we did was trying to engage them first as participants. Uh, as a participants, and I mean, we have had that more than 60 facilitators for the entire project, like six of them were the supervisors. So first they would be sitting in the program and participate in the discussion as a participant first before becoming like you know a real facilitators and then of course being uh, trained and this is like they sit in the 16 uh, i mean 14 sessions bi-weekly for seven weeks first and then through this they would be reflecting their uh, you know uh, behaviors and then of course we see a dramatical change just to give you a very good example a facilitator whom we have identified and selected in the program to be, a, you know, as a participant, and day one meeting us that, you know, he would be th throwing his socks to his sister to wash it. And then our intention is to slowly see through the process, see that he's the one who is washing it and recognize that this is something that he can also do. And then of course, trying to, uh, you know, seeing whether if he's displaying some sort of behavior that is respective to what's woman, in his own relationship, which would be reflected later on to the general public. So this was very much important to place them as a participant first. This also not only help, you know, trying to systematically um, uh, see their, uh, or I call it brainwash them in the program, but it would also uh, uh, enable them to start mastering the content itself and they would be evaluated also by being participant you know uh, by being placed by uh, as a participant and of course we give them different kind of uh, evaluation tests to see whether you know the change that we want to see are you know being reflected and once they completed the 16 days training we have had around 70 something facilitators and reduced them to 60, which we needed for the project. And they would be sitting on 16 days facilitation skill training 
and content mastery. Once they did the 16 days of uh, uh, training and then content mastery, uh, the next stage would be another multiple layer of preparation. For example, if a facilitator is going to facilitate a discussion, let's say session one, he is required to read that session at home. This would help him to put the entire you know, issues in the background of his mind because we want it to be an informal discussion rather than a teacher, you know, student relationship. And second, he would be sitting or she would be sitting with a, a peer, another peer facilitator. And then of course they would be exchanging ideas. And the third component would be sitting within their immediate supervisor where they would be debating, uh, briefing one another and feedback and sharing feedbacks to one another so that, you know, one facilitator, his weakness would be recognized by another one. And then of course they uh, share and receive feedbacks. So that's how we did in, uh, in relation to uh, the facilitator questions. I don't know the answer all. Yes, I think yeah. that's good. And we do have a couple others on facilitation, yeah. but I'm going to, to go to, to a couple other different um, questions. So from Fiona, um, many thanks for the presentations. Um, would it be possible to hear a bit more about perpetrator accountability Maybe particularly what kinds of mechanisms you had in place for responding to disclosures of perpetration of violence by participants in the groups. Um, and then just one other one other question for this section. Um, it's very interesting from Lizzie. It's very interesting that this was such a short term intervention. Uh, it would be good to get some more information on the total intervention time is approximately including hiring staff, training staff, setting up groups, implementation. And what sort of follow up with M&E was required afterwards to determine what extent we can use this in different types of protracted emergency settings as well. Yeah, let me go for the first one and Bandana may come for the second question. Great. Uh, yeah, so in terms of, you know, uh, perpetration of uh, violence by a participant, uh, you know, I, I mean, our curriculum has like a step-by-step -step guidelines. Uh, it has, you know, I mean, step-by-step uh, -step process where uh, the facilitator would be equipped on his own hand uh, what to do when experiencing this kind of, uh, you know, uh, situations. So the first thing is if we encourage to share experiences or personal opinions without giving names, within the discussion side, this is one mechanism. Do not share the name of the individual, but you're encouraged also to give, uh, you know, to share your personal experience, or you can say that other people's experience, and one thing. And when, uh, for example, and, uh, uh, and then of course the facilitator would be inviting individuals if they want to, you know, within the discussion, if they want to share anything in private, he or she would be ready to talk to them at the end of the session. So if they experience, uh, you know, calms where, uh, you know, there is a disclosure, wasn't the, the, the dis discussion, which never happened to us, but the facilitators are equipped to say that do not share personal experience here. We, he or she would be uh, closing, you know, the uh, stage for discussion right away. And then of course, call the individuals to come at a later stage and then of course, trying to tell them that he or she is not a counselor, but direct them to the psychiatrist that we have had at the Butajira hospital. So they have had the step-by-step -step process. We never experienced where, uh, you know, uh, a participant comes and tells us his or her experience in terms of, uh, you know, uh, violence within the relationship. But if we, you know, if it's all about opening the mind and the heart while being present, we keep our facilitators to open their hearts and minds and be present in that discussion, not to become absent-minded and then, of course, uh, invite participants to say anything they want. So they just block them if they suspect that participants are going to uh, reflect personal experience, but encourage participants to come at a later stage and try to uh, discuss with them. And then, of course, they will be uh, guiding them to various professionals. Thank including you. in the legal system we have also. Okay, thank you, Samuel. Great, I can uh, come in and answer the other question around the um, timing of the intervention and so on. So um, 
the each session was around two to three hours. So the total intervention time is 38 hours. Um, in terms of uh, the time in our project to sort of set everything up, hiring staff, training them, setting up groups, implementation, I would say that part was probably, and, and Samuel, you might have a better memory on this than me, but I think that was probably around a year. Uh, we did the implementation in a stepwise fashion. So we worked in two districts first and then in two districts um, after that. Um, so it was sort of spread out a bit in that sense. Um, it probably also took about a year for the actual development of the program itself and the pre-testing and sort of piloting prior to implementation. Um, in terms of the piece about um, emergency settings, um, and I think we'll have more time to discuss this in the second webinar, but the process for adapting the program to um, the humanitarian context that we worked in, um, I would say that process took us about two years because we did actually um, a quite a substantial a formative research piece um, in the refugee context first and then um, revised content and sort of went through um, a pretty lengthy process to ensure that the uh, sessions actually uh, address the drivers of IPV in that particular setting. So hopefully that answers that question. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, yeah, so there's a couple more. Another um, question, which I think has been answered around facilitator selection and how long is their training? Um, and then also um, around awareness raising and behavioral change programs are really great, but it also raises the question of whether there are proper GBV response systems in place. It will only be ethical to have response systems in place when in conducting such programs. Um, so what action uh, was done to improve the response system, particularly in places um, like Dolo Ado, where the GBV response system uh, is poor and non-existent? Um, so why don't we uh, address that? And then there are some questions around participant selection and things that we can move to. Great, so maybe I can uh, start with this and Samuel, if you want to come in as well to compliment, that would be great. Um, well, in, in the Butajira area, um, we uh, did a mapping of um, response services that were in place at the start of the project and we continued to kind of update that throughout. Um, so we had a list of available resources whether it's you know, legal, um, other women's NGOs, um, police, uh, and then um, health uh, response as well. We felt that the, there was a significant lack of um, uh, counseling and psychiatric services available. So we actually hired our own uh, psychiatric nurses and had them posted in the uh, local health facilities in the areas where we were conducting the, the program and um, provided uh, information about that service being available to all um, participants. Uh, so it didn't require, you know, a disclosure or, or someone having to say that they wanted a referral or that they had experienced violence to be able to access that. Um, in Dolo, um, we partnered with uh, UNHCR and the Administration for Refugees and Returnees who administer um, all programming in the refugee camps. They have designated one NGO as being the lead on GBV response in that setting. And so we, we worked closely with them. That NGO provides um, services related to GBV, um, clinical services and, and so on. And so we um, were able to refer um, as needed to, um, you know, to, to that partner. And Samuel, I don't know if you had anything you wanted to add no, as well. No, I think you, you did nice. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Very much. <laughs> um, and it is nice to see how like that whole spectrum of, of uh, prevention and response was addressed by the program. We're going to shift now to a few questions around the participants. Um, so Sayita had some questions around how were participants selected, 
how many were there per group and, and where were the sessions held? Um, and then were there any other parallel interventions uh, for the larger community? And, and this relates to uh, another question um, from Tizian, who, which, who asked, how, is, how do you raise awareness in, in the local context and, and engage men? Um, and then lastly, how many times can people take a session? So maybe we can focus on the participants for uh, a couple of minutes. And what was the second question? How, how to raise awareness with men? Uh, yes, how to, well, how do you raise awareness in the local context? So again, that, that is there anything that you were doing in terms of reaching out to the, the local larger community? Um, and then how do you engage men uh, as participants and in the larger community, I guess? Yeah. Um, so starting with said, said early question, um, uh, well, like Vandana mentioned, participants were selected randomly. I mean, the, the like, you know, we have had like four districts, Mescan, Marco, Sulte, and Soto identified. And uh, through the help of the local health bureau, we identified uh, a certain uh, proportion of participants who would be, uh, I mean, not participants, but the local districts or the village, we call them cabalists, uh, who would be uh, part of this. And once the cabalists are randomly identified and we have had like data, the baseline data being collected among a certain uh, group, which Vandana mentioned close to uh, 7,000. And we randomly uh, selected also intervention participants from this uh, uh, group of people. So that's how the discussion participants are identified and then of course randomly identified them uh, as male group, female group, and then woman group, I mean couples group, etc. And in each group, like I said, we have 20 individuals with men group 20 male, with uh, female group 20 uh, female participants, and with the couples group a husband and a wife paired, but we have had 20 individuals, 10 husbands plus 10 wife. And in terms of the venue of discussion, uh, we, we just try to grasp as anything we have in our hand and we, we didn't go for a hotel, that's too expensive. So we go to schools, uh, some of the church give us their uh, spiritual places where we could conduct discussions and mainly we, we use, you know, uh, private uh, areas like shaded areas, People, some of the participants give who has like, you know, big, big access room that would accommodate 20 uh, plus one or plus two individuals that we use their own rooms. And so the, the first thing is the schools, uh, you know, and followed by the, you know, the, how you call it, the religious uh, places, community, you know, local population areas, and as well as open spaces where we have like a private, a place where we can conduct a private as well as sensitive topics to discuss where no one is coming and then of course uh, giving us hard time. So that's how uh, we did. And then of course, in terms of uh, having parallel interventions to reach out uh, the larger community, we didn't have any, uh, the, there might be some, you know, uh, non-governmental uh, organizations who might have uh, been operated, but to my knowledge, not that would, you know, not those who would be parallelly intervening while uh, we were uh, implementing the project, but there were, uh, I mean, you can consider, for example, uh, other non-governmental NGOs who would be operating, uh, I mean, providing such, you know, uh, other services, the legal and the hospitals, et cetera, et cetera, but not to my knowledge. And then of course, uh, in terms of raising awareness uh, with uh, with local, you know, uh, men, and then how to do we engage them? The program is, uh, you know, designed to challenge norms that we all have, uh, either uh, norms related to men or to to women. And once they are uh, identified and selected, we uh, one uh, weapon we have is to work uh, very closely with the local um, health bureau. Especially, we have had like. Uh, Tepe has a big uh, health extension workers who would be reaching out to uh, the local community, mobilize uh, those um, 
randomly identified participants. And then, of course, we use our uh, words to, to engage uh, participants and to be present in some of the discussion at the very beginning, like the first or second se sessions, and uh, they would be convinced to remain. And then, of course, it's uh, like I said, you know, the sessions are uh, sensitive towards their religion, towards their cultural, cultural values, and then they would be uh, engaging in the entire program. Uh, considering its benefits mm -hmm. and then in terms of motivation I mentioned earlier we don't pay participants to to be engaged in our programs rather provide uh, some in-kind uh, uh, in-kind incentives or not more than you know like one one USD uh, per four sessions we don't pay like a session by session we have had like 14 sessions so we make a condition that if an individuals remain in the program for the first four sessions without any interruption. And then they would be receiving like, you know, a pair of soap or, you know, a kilogram of uh, rice or whatever. Uh, and then of course, we just want to, mot want to motivate participants to remain within, to be faithful to the entire process and come from session to session. Okay. Yeah, one, uh, one other, just a few comments on the selection of participants. Um, you know, as Samuel said, uh, the particip the selection was randomized, um, and that was because we were implementing this uh, randomized control trial in in uh, conjunction with the intervention, and so um, we essentially had eligibility criteria for um, inclusion in the trial. Uh, we selected households where there were uh, married or cohabitating uh, couples. Um, of reproductive age, and they had to have lived in the community for at least six months. Um, we did not exclude, you know, polygamous um, households. Um, in the in the case where there were um, where where there was a polygamous relationship in the household, we would randomly select um, one of the wives um, uh, if it was a woman's arm or couple's arm, and. Um, and uh, yeah, and so I think um, those were the main considerations, I think, in terms of the uh, participants. Mm. Samuel, just as a follow up to the, the question around the larger community, I'm just wondering if there was conversation, um, if you heard much about the couples, was it pretty much kept between the couples that were there or did, they, did you hear anything about them just informally talking about it with others in the community? Uh, yeah, that, I mean, that was um, one experience I remember. I think it was, was it last year, Vandana? I don't know. Uh, you may correct me. We were back for uh, a qualitative uh, data collection to see whether, you know, if uh, people are trying to uh, engage in some of, you know, the issues that they have been trained or uh, been given long after the program. So uh, one area that we have had in the United for a Better Life program was in, after each session, we have uh, an, a home tech assignment called community, I mean, um, commitment to action assignment. For example, they would be receiving a certain skill uh, or a certain session today, and they would be required to go home, commit the, themselves, and try to discuss some of the, you know, the issues that they feel very comfortable with their husband, daughter, uh, neighbors and other community members with whom they can feel more comfortable discussing these issues. Of course, when it comes to the issue, to the top topic, we encourage them to not expect change to happen overnight, but try to communicate very slowly. If it's, for example, uh, violence reduction issues with, uh, with a husband, don't ignite any, you know, issues. So we, we encourage them to go home and commit and trying to, 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 uh, initiate conversation and then of course we have uh, experience where participants were you know uh, raising the issues long after we went we we completed our program with neighbors like uh, in 2018 end of 2018 we were there in the field uh, doing the qualitative research and then of course people were taking over and then trying to remember some of the topics like for example the gender boxes and then they are raising it one another within their community and ask them by to how many people have you shared some terrace like we have this uh, um, community gathering called Edir and they try to discuss it one another but not in a formal way informally 
people were taking it over. And of course, there is a need also to go back and have a look to what extent they are uh, applying it or using it now. Mm. And just to kind of add to that, I mean, there were certainly many stories, um, and Samuel, I'm sure you, you know you have plenty of them from the field where. Um, you know, there are participants who were sort of motivated to go and kind of teach the same information to their friends. Like I remember one participant who we had talked to who every day when he was out in the field with his um, male friends would sort of relay all of the information that, you know, he had learned in the session the day before. Um, and so we had lots of anecdotal stories like that. Um, from the research side as well, we have evidence around um, the sharing of information and, um, you know, really high percent of participants indicated sharing with family members, spouses, um, friends. Um, I don't have the statistics off the top of my head, but it was quite high. And then I mentioned as well that we had uh, randomly selected households to serve as a spillover sample, which um, basically th these are households that are like neighbors that didn't actually participate in the program, but it allows us to see if there are any changes that happened in those households too, just as a result of sort of direct effect, indirect effects of the program. And we're working on that analysis now, but we do see um, quite a few changes in those um, spillover households as well, which strongly suggests diffusion of information beyond the direct uh, participants to the larger community. Mm. Okay, great. Thank you very, very much. And I assume that will be shared broadly once you're when I've done that analysis, or I should say, I hope that that will be shared broadly once you're done your analysis. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> a, couple of, um, a couple more questions here from the audience. Uh, from Lori, do you have thoughts or experience about the comparative feasibility or value of spreading the 14 sessions out over a longer time versus twice a week? Did you try different timings or think about giving more time for things to, to sink in? That's a great question. Um, maybe I'll just uh, share some thoughts first and then Samuel, I know you were also very involved in this, so I'll let you um, also come in. Um, in the early stages, um, we actually conducted several pilot studies um, before sort of starting the RCT and the larger implementation of the program. One of the pilots actually tried to look at this issue of um, the timing and frequency of the sessions. And we actually compared uh, delivering the sessions once a week over 14 weeks versus the twice weekly over seven weeks. Um, we, we sort of gathered data on attendance rates, um, on uh, preferences of the participants, um, kind of knowledge retention between sessions, like a whole bunch of different things. And after that process sort of ultimately concluded that the seven week uh, delivery period with the sessions timed you know, twice a week was what was preferred by the participants uh, it also had sort of higher attendance and we, we sort of saw, you know, more retention of information. And so we went with that. Um, Samuel, did you have any other insights from that piloting that we did that you wanted to share? Uh, not, not really, you know, like um, it, it's just a compliment to what you, what you said. For example, when we are, uh, we had the intervention and if, uh, uh, for some of the factors that I mentioned, whether, you know, weather related issues or social related issues, the intervention was like interrupted for uh, a day or two. We have had that experience, for example, in the Somali project, uh, uh, the Dolado project. It's quite impossible to return back to participants. Once you fix a certain day and that is interrupted, it would be like a struggle to return back. And so it would significantly, uh, you know, affect the attendance level and or to retain participants back. So I think that was one one consideration we have had when we decided like, you know, to have a bi weekly intervention. It's not about finishing the entire, you know, uh, intervention quick and then going out. No, but it's, it's all about relation to retaining participants and then of course, uh, making sure that they understand what we are talking about without uh, that much significant time in between this and that session. 
Great. So we have two other questions. Um, I think this is a quick one. Caroline is wondering what the name of the SGBV envoy working with the UNHCR is, if you can share that. Um, and then a question from Asiya, uh, which we may need her to elaborate on, but the, the, the program, maybe you'll, intro, uh, you'll, you'll get what she's asking. The program is interesting, but how do you achieve the goal only in coffee ceremony strategies specifically related to IPB? Um, let's see, we may need you to elaborate on that unless Samuel and uh, Vandana uh, have a bit more mm -hmm. understanding of that. Um, maybe the first SGBV program, the question was in terms of, you know, what was the name? Yeah, what was the name of the SGBV envoy um, working with UNHCR? Oh, uh, it, it was called WAHA, Women and Heads Alliance International, where I used to work. Uh, with uh, UNHCR uh, implementing the Dorado project. I don't know if they are uh, asking okay. the Alliance International or WAHA. And the program is called Unite for a Better Life. Great. Yeah, and um, in addition, the uh, this may have also been related to the uh, partner for referrals, if, if um, that was of interest to the, the partners that we worked with um, that, that uh, do the GBV service provision. Um, at the start, in the first few years of the project, it was IMC, International Medical Corps, and then um, later on it was PABDA. Um, is that right, Samuel? And then, oh, oh and, and RADO as well. There, so there were three that I think yeah. were. Um, PABDA, PABDA, yeah. Okay. Great. Um, and for As Asya's question, sorry if I'm saying your name incorrectly, it would it'd be lovely just to have a clarification. Um, about the uh, question so we can answer um, appropriately. Mm -hmm. We'll give her a second to, to write something in the chat or to come off of mute. Just raise your hand if you want to come off of mute. Um, I see it. And I think that if there's any other questions, we have a couple other, we have a couple more minutes. Um, Otherwise, um, we do have a couple more minutes. So Samuel and Vandana, Vandana, if there's anything you'd like to share, uh, any final any final thoughts um, that you'd like to share with the with the group before we close. I don't know. Maybe the video would be good. Maybe the sharing the link of the video that would speak more about the program. <laughs> okay. Sure. Yeah, we yeah. we can send that along. Actually, I don't have it at my fingertips right now. Um, yeah. So, but we can definitely share that. Um, we have uh, just a really short video so that uh, demonstrates or shows illustrates the um, program delivery and you know some of the participants and so on, so you can get a better sense of what it looked like um, in the field. Okay. Great. Okay, well, this has been a really interesting session. Um, such a fantastic program and, and I really look forward to uh, both reading your report on the research when it comes out and, and also in the next um, couple of webinars that we do together around learning about how it was adapted to the different interventions and, the, and then about the podcasts. Um, I think the podcasts, you know, particularly we're, we're having so many prevention partners right now shifting to thinking about how they can use radio and other other means um, given the current state of the world. So I'm sure we're going to have lots of interest in how we can adapt and the positive messaging that can be used in that kind of context. Um, so to everyone out there, if you're interested in those uh, sessions, please keep your eye out. Um, please sign up to the Prevention Collaborative website, uh, prevention, um, collaborative um, dot prevention dash collaborative dot org um, which will mean that you'll get the you know you'll be sure to get the um, the link to the the invite directly when we when we schedule those sessions uh, and I can see that um, Samuel has shared the link to their video yeah. in the chat box um, so again, thank you to everyone for participating. Really, really helpful. And in particular, thank you to Samuel and Vandana for sharing your experience. We look forward to hearing more from you in the near future.